Peace be with you. Friends, we come to Epiphany Sunday and that marvelous story from the Gospel of Matthew, the journey of the Magi, the wise men coming to see the Christ child. Of course, it's beguiled artists and poets and preachers for centuries. I think we can distill some marvelous spiritual lessons from this perhaps overly familiar story. So let me walk through it and see if we can find the spiritual richness. You know, first of all, it has to do with what the gospel calls magoi, the magi. I think the word magician would be related to that. The magoi were probably some kind of combination of what we would call astronomers and astrologers. So in the cultures to the east of the Holy Land, there was a well-developed culture of stargazing. Now, part of it for scientific purposes, we would say. But their deepest purpose was to discern in the stars and the heavenly bodies signs of God's intention and God's purpose. So hold in your mind's eye, the Magi, night after night, in season and out, gazing up at the stars, trying to discern the purpose of God. There's lesson one. Be attentive. Be attentive in the spiritual order. We spend so much time attending to all kinds of things, don't we? I remember years ago, I was on an airplane, one of these long flights. There was a fellow across the aisle from me, and he was using one of those uh, like crossword puzzle books. And I'm not kidding, for four hours, he attended to that book. Now, good, it was a way for him to kill the time. But I thought, how many of us attend with that sort of focus to the things of God? So think of the Magi looking up into the stars as an image of, of prayer, of contemplation, of seeking out the purposes of God. How much time, honestly, do we spend doing that? Once they saw the star, they acted. Now, travel in the ancient world was a very dicey business. We take it for granted. We have these, you know, beautifully paved highways and we drive for hours and hours and we cover all sorts of miles. We hop into an airplane, we can cross oceans. But in ancient times, travel was a very difficult business. People often made out their last will and testament before heading off on a long journey. Imagine now, even for these probably fairly aristocratic figures, how difficult the journey was. Remember that opening line of T.S. Eliot's wonderful uh, Journey of the Magi? A hard coming we had of it. Well, indeed, it would have been a hard journey over, you know, tracks and paths and over mountains and across valleys, the dangers of the road. People were exposed to, you know, to brigands and robbers and kidnappers, etc. Travel was very difficult. But the point is, the Magi, once they saw the sign, they acted, they followed, they did what they discerned God wanted them to do. Sometimes, everybody, in the spiritual order, we can be attentive. We can discern the will of God, but we can't muster the courage and energy to act, to do it. Despite the difficulties, despite our fears, we need to act. Think here of uh, Mary in the wake of the Annunciation. It says she proceeded in haste into the hill country of Judea. See, once she knew what the will of God was, she acted. She moved. Stay now with that image of the Magi making their perilous but steady way from their homeland, following the star. Have you followed the star? I'm asking myself that same question. As we discern God's will, do we have the courage to move, to act? They then face opposition. So we hear about Herod. Herod, who's terrified at the word of this new king being born. He's the king. What are kings, people that cling to power, especially worried about? Rivals to their power. So he gets word of this, this child who's a, a king. Well, wait a minute, I'm the king. And so Herod, of course, endeavors, once he hears the magi have crossed his borders, he endeavors to block them, in fact, to use them to get to this baby king. Third spiritual lesson, very important one. 
in the spiritual journey, we will always face opposition. Now, mind you, I'm saying always on purpose. I don't mean sometimes. I, I don't mean most of the time. I mean when you walk the spiritual path, you will face opposition. Now, you know, go back through the Bible, everybody. You'll see this point made over and over again from the Red Sea, you know, blocking the escaping Israelites, the, the flood that, that confronts uh, Noah, the, the uh, Philistines and the Assyrians and all those forces opposed to Israel. When you walk the spiritual path, you will face opposition. Now, how come? Well, it's a very simple reason. Because we live in a fallen, compromised world. So a world that is, is affected by sin in every aspect. So every individual we meet is a sinner. Look, we're, we're all sinners. But it seeps, too, into our institutions. It seeps into our general attitudes. We tend toward sin. We tend toward selfishness. Therefore, when someone has discerned the will of God and they've mustered the courage to move and to act, they will come up against the opposition of the world. See, because in some ways, fellow sinners, you know what I'm talking about here. When, when we see someone doing the will of God, at some level it kind of bugs us because it reminds us sinners of what we're not doing. And so we tend then to criticize or block or try to get in their way. So the opposition of the world, for sure. But then, I don't want to sound maybe overly dramatic here, but you will also face the opposition of enemies you can't see. I'm talking here about the dark spiritual powers, witnessed to all throughout the Bible and our great theological and spiritual tradition. There are forces unseen that stand in opposition to the ways of God. As long as we're opposed to God, they don't give us a lot of trouble because we're, we're in line with them. We discern the star, we muster the courage to act, we start walking the spiritual path. Trust me, those invisible powers will also seek to block us. So Herod here is a beautiful symbol of the opposition we should expect in the spiritual journey. You know, the problem, everybody, is for a lot of us, as you walk the path and you start facing the opposition, you say, oh, I'm not ready for this. Wait a minute, wait, I, I, didn't, I didn't count on this. Expect it, that's the point. Expect opposition. And then muster the courage with God's grace to face it down. So they make their way past Herod. They follow the star. They come to the Christ child. And then they open up these extraordinary gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So traditionally, you know, gold, he's a king. Frankincense, because he's divine. Myrrh, because he will suffer. Beautiful. But maybe look at it a little more generally. What do they bring the Christ child? These precious gifts. They break open these, these marvelous, precious things to give to him. Some of us discern the star. We muster the courage to act. We face down opposition, but at the propitious moment, listen now, we don't give Christ what's best in us. It's a decisive moment. You've, you've walked the spiritual path. You've made a lot of progress. And now the moment comes, do I give Christ what's best in me? The best of my mind. Love the Lord your God. Serve him with your whole mind. Do I give him the best of my heart with all my passion, all my emotion? Do I give him the best of my talents and abilities? Or, or and again, this is typical for us sinners, or I'll, I'll give God something of myself, but I'll reserve most of it, the best of me, for my secular pursuits and my career and, and my worldly goals. Do I give him my whole mind? Do I give him my whole heart? Do I give him my whole soul? Do I love him with all my strength as the Lord commanded us to? What gifts do you break open when you come to Christ? That's the question. And the Magi beautifully break open these 
hyper precious gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. See them perhaps as symbolic of what's best in you. Now name it. As you hear me speak, name what's really best in you. We've all got some you know, gifts and talents. Have we given them to Christ? Or are we reluctant and reticent? I'll quote Eliot again, measuring out our life with coffee spoons. Right? Do we measure out our gifts to Christ a little bit? No, no, no. The idea is to break open the coffers of your heart, mind, soul. Give them the best you have. And then lastly, I love this. Having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. I rely here on Fulton Sheen, who is in turn relying on the church fathers. Sheen said, of course they went to their home country by another way. Because no one ever comes to Christ and goes back the same way he came. What's the spiritual life all about? From seeing the star to mustering the courage to move, facing down opponents, giving the best of ourselves. The whole purpose is transformation. If we go through this process and we go back just the same way we came, what's the point? Again, Fulton Sheen said, the Lord didn't come to make us nice people. He came to make us new creations. If you follow this path, I'm preaching to myself now as well as to you, if we follow this path, trust me, we will go back by another route. We will be radically transformed. So, spend a little time today with this story. Walk through those five steps. Do you spend time surveying the night sky, looking for signs of God's presence? Do you muster the courage to act, to overcome your spiritual laziness? Do you, do you have the courage to face down the opposition that you will necessarily face? Do you break open the best of yourself to give it to Christ? If you do, trust me, you'll go back by a different route. You will never go back the same way you came. And God bless you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, I encourage you to share it and be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel.